Welcome. My name is Erica Check Hayden. I am a science journalist. I was a reporter at Nature for 15 years until this January when I left to become the director of the science communication program at the University of California, Santa Cruz. This afternoon, we're going to have a panel discussion with four of our speakers. And uh, the subject of the panel is where we're going and how we need to get there in tuberculosis research. Uh, our panelists are Gila Kaplan, Bavesh Khanna, Cliff, and Eric Rubin, who will be speaking after this panel. So I've prepared some questions for the panel. Uh, you should also feel free to ask questions. Uh, I think there is a microphone. There's two microphones in the room, so uh, go ahead and feel free to ask questions, um, and I will get us started. So the first question for the panel, um, given Gillis' analysis this morning that we need all of the components of the TB effort to be working and working together to make an impact on an epidemic, given also the reality of the fiscal situation that we're in with research funding in the US and around the world, where should we be focusing to make the most impact on the TB epidemic right now? The U.S. military. <laughs> I mean, they've got money. You're being filmed. Actually, that's not funny. They are the organization that will be able to mobilize funds as funds are, are cut and limited uh, with the other uh, organizations that are funded by the government. The question is, how do we make sure that research funds get assigned to the kinds of organizations that will be able to get funded? and then used for the right kind of things. I think it is a, s a really serious answer. It's probably the best scenario we can think of. that way. <laughs> <laughs> it was. <laughs> Organizations like DARPA, who've been funding basic research for quite a long time, Department of Defense are def funding basic research in a number of spaces. If we can divert funds through those organizations, we might be able to maintain level of research um, funding uh, higher than what uh, is going to happen if there are the cuts that have been anticipated. I'd add that we're incredibly uh, grateful and dependent, uh, uh, grateful for and dependent on uh, the Gates Foundation. Uh, they have really become one of the major funders in the area in particular for translational work and for uh, clinical, clinical work, uh, which is incredibly expensive. But just to f make the matters a little worse, I think, is that we haven't really entered into the, uh, the, the fully into the era of really expensive research, because when it comes to uh, licensing things, new drugs, new vaccines, um, that gets incredibly expensive. That's even expensive for Bill Gates. So I think, I know that um, the, the foundation has been thinking hard about how to triage things before they get to that point, but it's, it is going to be an even larger challenge com going forward. So I mean, I, I raised the issue of, of funding with Gila this morning, sort of as a tongue-in-cheek comment. But but just just to build on that, I mean, this, the scale of funding for TB is embarrassing. I mean, when you when you compare it to something like HIV, and you just compare the amount of funding that, for example, was required to to bring Doltegavir to market, I mean, it's it's folds of order in magnitude higher than than Bedaquilin, right? And when you look at the scale of the problem, it's just it's just huge. But I mean, I would say that we don't only need more money, but we also need to diversify the portfolio of people who fund TB. Because until you don't do that, you, you're going to always, um, you, you know, you have a lot of vulnerable populations for TB. So if we look in South Africa, you've got children, you've got people living with HIV, you have people in congregate settings, people who are confined in prisons. It's difficult that, you know, one set or a small, a small portfolio of funders are going to cover the, the research and translational aspects and, and delivery aspects that, that deal with all these vulnerable populations. So, so sometimes, you know, 
a certain population is not on strategy or you, you need a you need a broad base of of, of funders you know we, we can't just leave it to the gates foundation or a combination of the gates foundation and the nih other other people need to start putting skin in the game okay maybe i can add just another two points the one is that uh, when the new budget came out uh, the leadership at the gates foundation were assured that funding to the foundation would not be impacted by the need to backfill where other funding had disappeared. Bill specifically informed us that our funding will remain intact and any additional backfill that becomes necessary will be funded from other sources. So we at least know that we are not going to have to divide the pie any more than we already have with the programs that are existing at the foundation. The other thing that's really important to keep in mind is how one uses data to convince governments that it is in their financial interest to invest in TB. And I think I mentioned it a little bit before, but that's one of the things we are trying to do is to engage with the Global Fund and with governments to show them the data that supports uh, the assertion that it is financially advantageous for them to improve a TB control program um, because ultimately that will save them money. And I think that's one of the things that um, we are sort of just starting to explore systematically outside of our three main interest countries, which are China, India, and South Africa. How do we persuade governments that it is in their interest to invest in TB? And I think that the financial issue is the one that's going to swing uh, this conversation to the extent that anything will. Does that apply to the US as well? There's a lot of discussion with the US. Um, we have basically the foundation, but also Bill personally, essentially offered ourselves as a source of information uh, to be used to make these kinds of decisions. We cannot be seen to not, you know, to be partisan in any way, to take sides, to have political agendas. But we have basically been, um, Bill has done it, and the foundation, to a lesser extent, um, have suggested that if you want any data to support decisions, we are there to provide it. And I think for global health, at least, uh, Bill is one of the few people who's really spent a lot of time in Washington talking to people and trying to raise these agendas in, in, in as neutral a manner as possible. I want to ask a question, some questions about research. So starting out with basic research. So um, in the areas of all the areas of TB research that we need to be looking at drugs, vaccines, diagnostics, um, transition and transmission and pathogenesis research. Um, what are the big unknowns in basic research that we need to understand to advance a more targeted agenda in these, in these different fields? And you can speak to your own sort of fields that you know best. <clears throat> I haven't said anything well. <laughs> All right, so I'll just, I mean, I, I can only speak to the drug space, I think, um, and maybe the diagnostic space, but I mean, what are the big unknowns? I think um, we've heard a lot of them today, and we've, we've sort of, we've thrashed out a number of them today, and I think that's, um, we really don't um, still understand the, the basics of the pathogenesis of the disease as it exists across the spectrum of humans and the spectrum of different kinds of TB lineages that are present and circulating in the world today. And I think that understanding means that we, we tend to treat TB as though it were one disease. I mean, we have one, you know, we have one laboratory strain, right? We all use H37RV, and we have largely one animal model that everyone uses, the black six mouse. And, and you've started to hear some diversification away from that, so I think the field's moving in the right direction. But I think as long as we don't get our mind around the fact that TB is actually a spectrum of diseases and disease manifestations and severity of disease and subclinical 
um, that we're really not going to make any progress in treating TB as though it were as though we were treating it from the public health sector. One of, one of the, the things that always strikes me is, and kind of annoys me is, you know, HIV is treated as by physicians and hospitals as a disease, right, as, and, as an individual patient. And yet TB is treated through the public health sector as though it were a generic disease that were the same across all patients. And it's clearly not, I and mean, we understand that it's not. But it's easy for us to retreat into the basic, um, as basic biologists, and I still count myself that most of the time, um, we still tend to think of it as just one disease and as though it were one single entity. And I think as long as we don't confront that in the lab with our models and with our approaches, um, we're not going to make progress in, in conquering TB, the disease, in the world. <clears throat> I pick up on one aspect of that, and I think it equally applies to vaccines. Uh, the other uh, part that uh, only Gil at the table has actually worked on. Um, <laughs> but uh, the extension of anything we do to human disease is a real challenge. Um, it, they just won't let you do experiments in humans. Um, and until that changes, um, uh, we are stuck with various experimental animals and in vitro systems. And I think they're great. I think there's a lot to be learned in them. But, it, 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 but once we find those things, we have to somehow figure out how to make the transition to validating whatever we find in humans and, and, and f figuring out whether it's, uh, it, it, it really works. Um, in the drug space, as uh, Cliff was talking about, there are differences. They're not nearly as dramatic as they are in, on the immun immunology side, though, uh, where uh, we really don't understand what happens in people well. We don't really understand what happens in animals that well. But we don't understand what happens in people well. We don't understand what protection is. Uh, so uh, I, I think that there's still room for... Uh, tools to understand human disease uh, better. We heard about some of that from Cliff uh, this morning where we can uh, image people and, and, and especially uh, in the context of trials of therapies. Uh, but I think we need a lot more of that. So, so I, would, I would add um, uh, a couple of things to that. I think transmission and understanding the mechanics of transmission is really important. I stand under correction, but today, I think an individual is more likely to have drug-resistant TB by transmission, by acquisition of a drug-resistant strain, rather than being non-compliant. That's the amount of transmission that's going on in some, in some TB endemic countries. Trying to understand what are the biophysical limitations that, that, that are placed on, trans, uh, on transmission and how does one develop uh, effective transmission blocking strategies. And, and sort of related to that is the issue of host susceptibility. You know, so why is it that you know, TB is an incredibly interesting disease from, uh, from um, the way it plays out in, in the human population. You have a bunch of people who are exposed, but only some get infected. Of those that get infected, only some progress. Of those that progress, some present in, in the clinic. Of those that present in the clinic, they go on treatment, some respond faster and some respond slower. There's just so much, there's so much to study if we want to understand how to eliminate the disease. So I think some of that, some of that features for me as, as key gaps. Okay, I have a pet topic when, uh, when it comes to what, where's the gap in knowledge? Um, and I suppose this goes back to the times that I was running my own lab and doing research. I think that the understanding of the host pathogen interaction in the context of the granuloma is not only essential um, for informing us exactly how we shift the balance between a very happy coexistence between the host and the pathogen until finally the pathogen escapes and doesn't mind if the host dies. Um, and in order to understand this balance in the granulomas, and I've been saying this for a long time, we have to understand the spatial organization and interaction between the host and the pathogen. This isn't a cell that's infected by MTB. It's an entire host response with microenvironments where the organisms are better or worse controlled in different parts of the same lesion. Not only different lesions, but the same lesion. And the complexity is amplified significantly if you look at a single granuloma and you realize that there are different microenvironments there. So that spatial distribution of the interaction between the host and the pathogen in the lesion whether in the lung or otherwise, is probably one of the most important things that we have to study. It's not going to work if we isolate single cells 
and look at them in vitro in the lab because that's the way we're used to looking at T cells or macrophages or whatever. We have to look at them interacting within the organization of the granuloma and what works and doesn't work for the host or the pathogen within that context. I, I would just mm -hmm. uh, question that, I mean, thinking about uh, our work where we're trying to under, understand using you know, reductionist approaches, what, what, what the role of individual genes are. And, and certainly there's a lot of work that goes into just doing that. But then to layer on top of this, the, then to do, and I don't even know which assay, Gila, you're talking about in terms of spatial organization, right? And in, in, in much less going to humans or, or, or you know, whatever, macaques or marmosets or whatever, that, 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 um, that, that seems like a barrier uh, for understanding, uh, you know, complex genetic interactions from just from just the bug side of things. So, to, so I, I hear you that that of course you, the the disease is manifest in many different ways and it's complex. It's not just a bug that you're going to kill right away with a, with an antibiotic, uh, and they're all going to die. Um, but it, it does seem like, at least from the, from the fundamental discovery standpoint, when you're trying to reduce as many variables as possible <laughs> that in, in order to do, you know, to, to make progress, that to, 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 to add that on top of it seems really, really difficult. But, I, but I, I think that you've done that, Jeff. I mean, by starting with it from a reductionist standpoint and you make a mutant or you make a chemical tool and then you ask what happens in an animal model given that mutant, you found that the... Um, uh, you found what you were looking for by a reductionist method, but then you went on to ask what's going on in the context of a real infection in a real uh, uh, multicellular organism. So I think we, and I think it's, get, as, as you go into more and more, more complex systems, those that form granulomas and all, it gets harder and harder. Uh, but I think it's doable. It's just you have to keep your eye on that ball all the time. But, but it, I think, though, that what, what I'm thinking is that to put that filter ahead of time, right? And that yeah, is that, to put the filter that it works in a mouse, Can't and you get some phenotype in a mouse before you, you progress yeah. to these things, that, that, that I think, is, yeah, I is very difficult. But, I, I mean, we know that we can do analyses today on single cells, OK? Whether it's phenotypic analyses or even gene expression and so on in single cells. The problem is when we take a granuloma, mash it up, and then do all our analysis on the single cells when they mixed together, and we know there's going to be a diversity of responses, what we're not taking into account is which cell is talking to which cell, which T cell is talking to which macrophage, et cetera, et cetera, within the granuloma. So what you have to go back to is some kind of in situ analysis where you know where the cell comes from, the way Cliff can show you which granuloma he's tracking as he looks at treatment, you're gonna to have to actually say which cell or which part of the granuloma are you tracking as you do the cellular analysis. It's doable today, it just is hard. You have to get human tissue, you have to use the right kind of animal models, but it's going to have to be done in order to really understand why there's only organisms in the middle of the granuloma and not in the periphery which means why are the organisms being controlled in the periphery and not in the center, or whatever it is. You take his pictures of the organisms in the center, or your pictures of the organisms in the center, as a given. Well, why are there only organisms in the center? In the mouse, they're all over the place. There's a question up in there. Yeah. Oh, yes. Um, I'm working at I'm working at a public health lab, um, performing drug sensitivity testing, and we have experienced at least two cases of reversion of drug resistance. And I wonder if it is interest of performing um, uh, some study on the mechanism causing the drug resistance reversion. And we published one paper, uh, case, and the, the second one, we haven't prepared for it. And then we know it is not infected by two different strains. We have a molecular and drosophility to, to pr prove it. We've shown in the past that even with the same strain in the same lung of a single patient, you can get heteroresistance. 
which no, that's was not heterosis. It's different resistance in different organisms from the same patients, from the same strain. Essentially, what I would assume you're seeing is not reversion, but rather the control of those organisms that are drug resistant, while other organisms that are not drug resistant are now coming out of different granulomas that haven't undergone, where the organisms haven't undergone that mutation. I don't know if there's any evidence for real reversion, but there is a mixture of strains of MTB organisms in the lung, and it's possible that one granuloma is controlled and the other one continues to spew out organisms and that the one had drug resistance and the other didn't. So, so we, we, had a, we had a couple of patients um, um, in our study that, that looked like that. So in, in many of our cohorts, we exclude drug resistance. But um, there, was one, there was one really interesting patient from Seasway Hospital, um, and, and the individual had a double RPOB mutation. And, and also, you know, over a period of eight years, you saw resistance, susceptible, resistance, susceptible, riding on top of what looked like the same strain background. Um, and you know, when you we couldn't correlate it with any kind of pathology because there wasn't a lot of there wasn't any X-ray data. But the assumption we worked on is what Killer said is that you you're having multiple samplings coming out, and so you're seeing a mixture of organisms. And at any one point, when you if you're doing drug susceptibility profiling by midget culture, you're jackpotting on the biggest population that's there, and so it comes out as either susceptible or resistant. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's very difficult to, the problem is it's, you can really try and do it very carefully, but it's very difficult to get clarity. Yeah, it's because it's a very heterogeneous situation. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask a few questions about specific components of the, the fight against TB. So a question about diagnostics. Drawing on the analysis that you showed us this morning, where there are so many gaps in that flow, um, where, where can you make the most impact with a diagnostic? Something, something that didn't require sputum. Uh, that, that's really the, that, that, because the sputum diagnostics are A, difficult and technically challenging. B, they often, they, you know, in many places they require some sort of skill set and, and, and often some, and some separation because the sputum is dangerous. And, and, and a lot of patients can't produce it, especially people with extra pulmonary TB and children, children in a really big population. Um, so something that would, that like um, Gila mentioned the urine lamb test or some other urine diagnostic like that, a blood test would be transformative, I think. The <clears throat> other thing that we think might be useful in terms of diagnostics are triage tests that are cheap and easy to carry out so that by the time you get to the more expensive conclusive diagnostic test, you've reduced the number of tests you have to carry out. Because if you look at what happens in a diagnostic lab today, um, for example, in some of the labs in South Africa, the majority of samples that come into the lab for a gene expert are, are negative and they're not TB patients. And yet you're paying over $10 for each cycle of diagnosis with a gene expert. If we could screen out those that are probably not TB and then limit the number of cases that come in for a confirmatory case detection, uh, the cost would go down. Um, and that would be extremely valuable. And that's where a triage test serves a purpose. Obviously, you want the triage test to be cheap easy to carry out, and if possible, lower down in the service structure so that the only people who actually are likely to have to be are referred to the central labs. Samia, so, yeah, I think with diagnostics, uh, uh, there are two important things I, I would put forward that's worthy of consideration. Um, and the first is, I mean, we, we all accept that we need point of care diagnostics, so you need to move as far away from central towards decentralized care or, or somewhere in between. Um, but the, the thing is, um, you know, so we've had experience with gene expert, for example. It's one, thing to, it's one thing to have a molecular diagnostic and to say that something works, but to actually implement it in the healthcare system is completely different, you know. So, so the experience in South Africa, so South Africa bought the first set of gene experts in 2010, and you want these, you want these instruments to be point of care, right? But in a program, how do you actually verify that they work? 
when you place them in a, in a, in a point-of-care setting. You know? So you have the internal standards that show that the machine works, but how do you know that the process works? And so South Africa went through a two-year program to develop instrument verification and quality assurance assays that delayed the rollout of GeneXpert to, to all the sites. So we need to consider that as we develop diagnostics, you know, how are they going to be implemented and how are they going to be verified on-site in the clinic? And then, and then the second thing is, of course, you can diagnose, but you've got to link to care. Right, so the linkage to care is incredibly poor, and, and, and the data with experts shows. And maybe expert hasn't been around for long enough, but you know, initial initial analysis from the extent study shows that it hasn't had an impact on mortality because you have you have to link the diagnosis to effective care, and so that's that's something we we always going to grapple with. Okay. Um, a question on drugs: How can we think about developing antibiotics that are resistant to inducing resistance? <clears throat> yeah, well, I'm, you know, so I've thought about this a lot. I mean, I think that um, one of the things we've tried to do is to screen up front for mechanisms that uh, impose large fitness costs on the organism when resistance is engendered, right? So if the fitness cost is large enough, then you won't see resistance emerge as frequently as if fitness costs are the same. That's a hard thing to do, um, and it's hard to sort of pick the targets that will be resistance proof, but, um, but we do know there are some things that are like that, the, uh, and, and some of them are mechanism-based, and some of them are based on the physical properties of the, the compounds that are present. I think that's a, an emerging area that a lot of people are thinking about. We always revert to combination chemotherapy, but if you, th you think about combination chemotherapy for tuberculosis, it should be impossible to get an XDR um, strain of TB to ever evolve, right? I mean, it's, it's mathematically, it's impossible that we would have so many organisms present that we would be able to select simultaneously four resistances and get a completely resistant organism, and yet it happens. And so the other concept is that um, the actual penetration of the drugs into the lesions is so different that, in effect, you've got populations that are exposed to monotherapy, and because of that, you end up selecting individual uh, resistances in different parts of it. And so, if we had a better handle early on in the discovery process of, of drugs that penetrate with roughly equal pharmacodynamics into the lesions, we would avoid resistance the way combinations are supposed to work. <clears throat> And the other thing is operational. I mean, Cliff mentioned the fact that you, if you're treating with four drugs, why should you get resistance? But if you give patients single pills and they take the pills that don't give them nausea or don't uh, interfere with their digestion or whatever, um, they're going to end up taking, exposing their organisms to single antibiotics or not to the right doses. So the at the end of the day, the fixed dose combination with the right combination of drugs is going to be essential to make sure that organisms are not exposed to single, organ, uh, single antibiotics at any time. Yeah, the corollary of that is one of the things that makes drug development uh, difficult in TB, which is you can't develop one drug. If you're developing drugs, for, particularly for drug-resistant TB, we know that you will get resistance. Um, even with the highest fitness cost, because the bugs are smarter than we are, they'll figure out a way to um, decrease the fitness cost of resistance. So um, that means you have to have, develop things simultaneously and probably test them simultaneously. Um, so we're not trying to make one drug, we're trying to make multiple drugs, uh, which is, it, it, it gives you two or three times the problems. Okay, um, a couple of questions about the host. So uh, one question is, how we can revitalize the vaccine effort, and, and should we be directing more effort there? Let me start, because I'll start on the vaccine skeptic side of the table. <laughs> um, the, uh, it's hard to overstate how important a very effective vaccine would be. It would put the rest of us out of business, which is why we're so opposed to it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but it, it, it's been difficult because um, we don't have good predictors of vaccine success. So we can make, there have been a lot of candidates produced, but it's difficult to know what, which ones are going to be successful without a good, um, actually I'm preempting my own talk. 
<laughs> um, but, but without a good test, it's, it's, it's difficult, and large clinical trials are super expensive. So um, we need a lot, we need more fundamental biology of immunity, I think. I think it's, I think what, the failures in the clinic have led people to decide that we have to go back and understand what we're doing better, rather than taking a lot of, uh, a, a lot of uh, swings for home runs every time. Gil, is that fair? I suppose you've covered some of the issues I would have raised, but... Um, That's a no. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I genuinely believe that um, we simply haven't invested enough really critical thought in what is going to ultimately constitute protective immunity. We've taken the position as a community of scientists that the immune response to TB is actually quite good, but not sufficient. And we haven't been critical enough at asking, is the host immune response to TB protective? Is it sufficient to protect? And are there components of the host response that are not seen during TB disease that might actually be more protective and improve on BCG or the fact that 90% of individuals who are infected don't develop active disease if they're not immune suppressed. Um, but, and this is something that we've put into our program of what we think needs to be funded at the Gates Foundation. But I think there's a scattering of people in the community who actually see eye to eye with us and the majority of people who are still working on the immune response to TB are sort of trying desperately to find a way to fit in the old paradigms and still come up with a protective response that's better than the ones we've looked at in the past. Um, that's not to say that CD4 T cells are not going to be protective, but they might not make gamma interferon or they might not be in the right place at the right time. Um, and I think that really what we need is a lot more understanding of immunology, a lot more work on interesting ways of analyzing the potential breadth of the immune response and trying to correlate it with uh, susceptibility and or protection. And if we do the clinical trials too early, we're going to run out of funds because every study that fails and costs close to $100 million is going to put people off from funding vaccine studies. And it'll look like it's more efficient to put funding into something else. So we have to be sure that we de-risk any clinical trials before we actually carry out the protective studies and understand better that they are likely to work because now we understand the host response. I'm, I'm actually curious about, uh, you know, th this sounds like a problem that innovation is required, right? Because doing the same old thing is gonna give us the same old answer. So I, I just wonder if there's anything in, in the pipeline or, or that, that you can talk about that, that is taking what people have learned from immunity to, to think about something innovative, whether it's in TB or outside of TB, as a, as a way to kind of paint a picture for for how we can how we can go. Because uh, for me, it's hard to understand how what, what that what that breakthrough would be that then would allow for a, a, a better vaccine. And do you want to say something? Thanks. Uh, I mean, I think the lesional heterogeneity within, in, in, within individual animals and people has been a breakthrough discovery. Because before in studying, at least in studying human immunity, we would study the peripheral blood. And you know, trying to get a signature from a peripheral blood that is integrating both lesions that control and even sterilize TB and those where there's progressive infection is hard and confusing. Um, so I, th I think that, um, I really think that's been a breakthrough. And one of our investments that we have is matching uh, human studies and non-human primate studies, isolating individual granulomas, imaging them to try to understand the in situ relationship of the organism to the different cell types, and then doing single cell RNA-seq. So I think that there's, you know, that the idea of 
trying to bring tools from immuno-oncology, high-resolution sequencing tools from human immunology with all the breakthroughs that are going on in the cancer field and in understanding the healthy immune system, bringing those tools, technologies, people, high-resolution analytics and computing that were developed for different area and just porting them straight into TB um, hopefully will accelerate the discovery process and lead to insights that then can be used to develop new candidates and um, measure their potential impact on immunity. There's been a recent paper that's shown that um, not all T cells actually leave the circulation into the tissue and that they have different phenotypes, for example. For years, we've done our immunology on blood. So the drug people have realized that you can't measure the antibiotic concentrations in the blood because that doesn't represent what's happening in the granuloma. It's time for the immunologists to realize that you can't measure immunity in the blood because actually there might be a completely different profile of homing of cells into the lesions than what you're finding in the circulation. And that actually you have to ask what is the nature of the cells at the site of infection that will make a difference. So those are the kinds of things that are slowly happening, um, which we need to consider. And we have the technology to do single cell analysis, so we should be able to start asking those questions. What is the heterogeneity? What is the difference between the cells that do and don't leave the circulation, that do and don't get into the center of a granuloma and so on? So we're back to the same question. The TB occurs in the lung, it doesn't occur in the blood. And if we're going to study the concentration of drugs, or if we're going to study the phenotype of the immune response, we have to study it where the disease occurs. But that sounds like it's, it's uh, uh, monitoring the, the response. And there has to be some correlate to protection, right? In order to know then, is your vaccine candidate giving you the, the right response, right? It's back to the same, same question. So is that what you're saying? Is that by like first understanding the heterogeneity and finding, for example, if you keep make a vaccine that would now allow for the right T cell to home to the site of infection for longer, that that correlates with protection, and then that would be used as a screen to then uh, evaluate new vaccines. How long do the T cells remain uh, stimulatory rather than sort of exhausted functionally? Where do they home to? Which antigens drive uh, ongoing T cell activation versus a short peak that then dies out. Which types of cells, not necessarily only CD4 cells, respond to potential antigens that might ultimately have an antimicrobial activity? That whole concept of heterogeneity, I think, now spans the entire field of tuberculosis research and needs to be incorporated into the way we're thinking. Tom, do you want to say something? The, um, I mean, I, I share those perspectives. I, th I think you know some of these are ideas that have not been fundable because they're such large-scale studies. Rather than people haven't thought about it, um, but I think you know sampling, you know, getting BAL fluid and doing in-depth immunologic profiling is is very challenging. And that's not even getting to the granuloma. So I, th I, th I think we still need more tools, and these are all large, expensive studies. Um, but I think that is you know, the, the heart of the problem. The only other thing I would throw in would be the human genetic side, which it is kind of the natural way to probe the different immune states of our body, you know, that we come hardwired with these, you know, genetic states that, that actually we can measure. And as long as we have functional genomics attached to it, we are able to state this is a genetic state that led to this outcome. But it has to be wed with the in-depth immunologic profiling that you're describing. One more question? Oh, go ahead, sir. Um, so we're uh, short on manpower and short on money in TB. And it seems to me like we should be poaching from every other field, um, poaching tools, technologies, methodologies, manpower, hypotheses, um, computational algorithms, everything. And the question is, how can we do that systematically and comprehensively? 
Well, Anne, you've been in this field. It's not hard to, rec and, and what we've seen today, I think, in the symposium, what we've seen, we saw for the last two days, is it's not hard to recruit people to TB. Um, that people who have the tools, who've developed all these great methods, uh, if you go to them with a question that involves TB, I think they're incredibly willing to, to uh, join in. So um, I, I think it's actually, I mean, there are two ways you can do it. You can be Gila and offer up a lot of money and then have people who aren't in TB uh, join, uh, join up, and that, that works, and that's happened. Uh, but we're kind of the ambassadors for TB. Um, so I, I think it's incumbent on us to try to recruit those people in um, as collaborators. It, it's a little intimidating, the field, because it's, they're not nice people here. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, no, but because there is a lot of knowledge base. Um, and and it, it, I think collaboration is a great way to get into it. Other thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, well, I mean, as the, so I've basically built the, the last five years of my career by stealing tools from oncology, right? I mean, I, I, I think that the secret is to talk and to, to talk to people in other fields and explain the problems and demystify TB in some way, because a lot of people are put off by it. It is a very microbiology-centric and, uh, and specialized um, set of tools. So, you know, a lot of the best tools that we've gotten available to us through the imaging stuff were all developed for oncology. And just because I happen to be in a place where I can talk to the oncologists and steal their programs and steal their fellows and get people interested in projects has been fantastic. And um, and also the more, I mean, you know, the more, um, so the access to human samples actually has probably never been better in the field, right? So people can actually get access to, to, to trial material, to clinical isolates that 10 years ago, that was a big deal. That was hard to do. And today I think it's relatively easy to do. And, you know, part of me showing you sort of what we're doing clinically is, is an advertisement for, you know, if you've got a question that you want to ask in human clinical samples or you need samples to ask it, and, you know, talk to us because that, I think this is, if I can do clinical work, anybody in this audience can do clinical work, right? I'm trained as a synthetic organic chemist. I, I have no medical degree um, and no access, no, no real uh, ability to do these clinical trials. And I wasn't afraid to try, um, but I do see it as a resource for the whole field, not just for our research program. So I think, you know, as a community, we have to pull together as resources shrink and we have to make good use of the, the samples and the, the tools that are available to us. And I'm willing to work with anybody who's got an idea to try to get them access to those samples to test the ideas. Great. I, I can testify to that. I've gotten samples from Cliff. He charged me $12.75. I don't know what that was about. It's because you're a real doctor. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to make one point. For at least 20 years, probably longer, I used to go to TB meetings, and I would give the one and only clinical relevance talk <laughs> at the end of a two-day, three-day, four-day, five-day TB meeting, and everybody else was working either in vitro or in cells or in mice. Now, that's changed. At least... The field is realizing that we have to look at at least human cells, human strains, and if possible, the human disease. So we are making progress towards understanding TB in humans rather than infecting mice, which wouldn't get TB if we didn't infect them. Um, so I think things are changing, and that's actually where we have to go. We have to find a way to work on the models that are fit for purpose, answer the question we're trying to answer, and ideally will lead us to human studies. And that's something we'll have to learn from other fields too. I think, Anne, you, you raise a very important question. We've reached a space in TB now where we need the prowess of as many disciplines as, as we can get. But my, my own experience is that, um, you know, you have to formulate what your gaps are. You know, so, so we needed a lot of computational input. And when we went to computational biologists and statisticians, they says, yeah, we, we know how to do stuff, but tell us specifically what you need. Yeah, we can come sit in your lab meeting. We can tell you what we can do, but that's not going to be useful. So I think it's... Uh, we, we, we need all this input and integrated approaches, but I, I think we need to identify the gaps in terms of what we need that will enhance the whole value proposition of, of the overall initiative. And, and, then, and then you'll find people are very willing. I've, I've, I've always found people very willing. They recognize TV as a problem, and if, if, if they can help, people jump in. Well, we'll leave it there. Let's thank our panelists.